<laughs> so cool. I'll open this up in prayer and we'll get started. Sound good? All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening, and thank you for what you want to speak to us tonight. Thank you for the way you're moving in this church and all of our lives, and we just open ourselves up to you tonight to speak to us, to move us, and to just, we want to hear what you have to say to us. In your name we pray, amen. So it was uh, kind of cool, because last week DJ told me, he's like, hey, we just finished First John chapter 1, and we're going to go to chapter 2, but I can't be there, so just do chapter two and do as much as you want, one to two verses or do the whole chapter. I'm like, I mean, we need to get some stuff done, so I'll probably go through the whole chapter because why not? And then I started praying and I'm only getting through two verses. Yeah, exactly. I'm kind of excited because what was kind of cool is after he'd said that to me, it was last Tuesday and on Tuesday afternoons from 12 to 1, we opened the building for prayer and sometimes people come by, sometimes they don't. But either way, me and DJ usually just end up being here in prayer, and God just started talking to me. And it was really neat, because prior to us coming out here, we'd been watching these videos of different church services, and the altars were packed, and people were getting prayed for, some people were getting healed, some people were just getting set free of stuff, the preaching was amazing. And so when I came out here, I just started like circling through here and just praying for our altar. And like, God, like, open this up, let your spirit move here, let it do something cool, which, side note, Sunday was awesome, right? Like, a hundred people were down at this altar because they were invited just to celebrate and worship and praise God. And it's not because I prayed, I don't think, but I think it does lend itself to, like, when we invite God into a space, he will meet us there, whether it's in our lives, whether it's in his place at the altar. So I thought that was really cool. But so when I was down here praying, I was like, God, just work in this altar. What do you want to do here? And what I kept hearing him say to me is, this altar is the fire line. And I'd keep praying, and I'd hear him say, like, well, this altar is the fire line. I was like, that's cool. It sounds awesome. But I have no idea what that means. Because um, it sounds neat. kind of sounds like a movie type thing, the fire line. But uh, so I kept praying, and I felt like he wanted me to read First John chapter or 2, starting with verse 1. So let's go ahead and read that real quick. And then we'll go from there. I use my phone because it's a lot easier for me to track. All right, 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And I was like, okay. I see that's kind of a follow-up to what Pastor DJ talked about last week with sin and what it is and missing the mark. And I kept asking him, I was like, but what does that have to do with the fire line? And then he just started downloading stuff into me. It says here that Jesus is our advocate to the Father. And then once I started getting that in my head, I started thinking of all these stories, and I got to Moses. And what had happened prior to Moses is there was a disconnect. In creation, the fall of man, there was a disconnect from us and God because of our sin and his holiness. So with Moses, he instituted the law, which was a huge step forward for them because they had never known how to be right with God and what the standard was. So God institutes the law, which had like some 600 very specific do's and do nots, which was nearly impossible to follow. And so he knew they were going to mess up. He knew they were going to screw up. So he designed this priestly system with, through Aaron, Moses' brother, and how they would come to God and atone for their sins, whether it be through the slaughter of bulls and goats and animals. And they would go through and pray, and they would have this place at the altar that only the priests could go, and then they would atone for their sins. And so we're going to go ahead, and we're going to read about one of those moments in Numbers chapter 11. And so Moses was kind of one of the first advocates for us, and I'll kind of use the word advocate, priest, and mediator kind of interchangeably as we talk through tonight. And Moses was kind of our first advocate. And we're going to go, like I said, Numbers chapter 11, starting with verse 1. And we're going to read through a couple stories, and they're not nice stories. Like, they're not going to make you feel all warm and tingly. They're kind of barbaric, almost Game of Thrones-esque. Um, and so we'll go ahead and start with the first one. Numbers chapter 11 says, now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then the fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So that place was called Tibera because fire from the Lord burned among them. 
So that was Moses advocating for them. They angered God, fire came, and he prayed for them. Now we're going to go to another story because they just didn't seem to learn. Numbers chapter 16. Give you guys a second to get there. I printed it out so I can be super quick. (laughs) Numbers chapter 16. We're going to start with verse 1. And here we go. Korah, son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and certain Reubenites, Dathan, Abram, son of Elab, and the son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourself up above the Lord's assembly? So their sin here that they're already propositioning with is God had set up this system where they needed an advocate. They needed a priest. And basically they're saying, we don't need anything. We are already holy us. We don't need any atonement. We don't need anything. We are already on par with God. So picking back, yeah, I know, not setting it up for a good scenario. So we're going to jump into verse 4 again. When Moses heard this, he fell face down. Then he said to Korah and all his followers, in the morning, the Lord will show you who belongs to him and who is holy, and he will have that person come near him. The man he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. You, Korah, and all of your followers are to do this. Take censers and tomorrow put burning coals and incense in them before the Lord. The man the Lord chooses will be the one who is holy. You Levites have gone too far. Now we're going to jump down to verse 16. Moses said to Korah, you and all of your followers are to appear before the Lord tomorrow. You and they and Aaron, each man is to take his censer, put incense on it, 250 censers in all, and present it before the Lord. You and Aaron are to present your censers also. So each of them took his censer, put burning coals and incense in it, and stood with Moses and Aaron at the entrance to the tent of meeting. When Korah had gathered all of his followers in opposition to them at the entrance to the tent of meeting, the glory of the Lord appeared to the entire assembly. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. But Moses and Aaron fell face down and cried out, O God, the God who gives breath to all things, will you be angry with the entire assembly when only one man sins? Again, they're advocating for them. Then the Lord said to Moses, stay to the assembly, move away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abram, and the elders of Israel followed him. He warned the assembly, move back from the tents of these wicked men. Do not touch anything belonging to them, or you will be swept away because of their sins. So they moved away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. Dathan and Abram had come out and were standing with their wives, children, and little ones at the entrance to their tents. Then Moses said, this is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things. And it was not my idea. If these men die a natural death and suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about something totally new and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them and they go down alive into the realm of the dead, then you will know these men have treated the Lord with contempt. As soon as he finished saying this, all this, the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their household. All those associated with Korah, together with their possessions, they went down alive into the realm of the dead with everything they owned. The earth closed over them and they perished and they were gone from their community. At their cries, all the Israelites around them fled, shouting, the earth is going to swallow us too. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Like I said, not an exciting, happy, fun story. And they basically came to a God who had delivered them and said, this is my standard. This is how you can be okay with my holiness. And they said, we don't need that. And so the encounter with sin and holiness is always going to result in death because that was the price for their sin. And the penalty for their sin according to the law, had to keep being paid because there wasn't a perfect sacrifice or a perfect priest to offer that sacrifice. And so that is why Jesus then came as the perfect priest and he then became the perfect sacrifice. So in side note, a lot of years when I've been taught on these stories, what then was kind of caught and taught by me is that Jesus then came to rescue us from an angry, mean, bitter, old, grumpy God. 
And that's not the case. I mean, it's easy to draw these conclusions, but in the Gospels, or not the Gospels, Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If we want to know the character of God, we look at Jesus. So God knew from the beginning of time that his holiness could not exist with us. He knew that for him to get close to us, it would like result in an automatic death. That was just the way it was. So he knew that there was nothing we could do, and this whole law system that he helped institute was just a stepping stone for us to kind of draw closer to him. So he sent Jesus as that. And so we're going to go ahead and go to Hebrews chapter 7. We'll look at where whoever wrote Hebrews, whether it be Paul or some woman or whoever they debate, debate wrote it. Uh, it's, it's questioned if it was Paul. Some people will advocate that it was one of the female disciples. Some people will, I don't know. <laughs> it's not, traditionally they'll sometimes attribute it to Paul. All right, Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to start at verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest is like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of the indestructible life, and Jesus was that indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it is not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Verse 22, because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but Jesus lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, and pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. You guys don't have to turn to it because I'll reference it. First Timothy 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that man is Jesus. Such a cool thing. So Jesus was the perfect priest and the only one able to come and offer the perfect sacrifice so we could come and be okay in God's holiness and not be totally destroyed in God's holiness because of our sins. And here's where the whole fire line thing starts to come into play, which made me really excited. So the priest would go in and they would offer their sacrifice because God's presence dwelled, his holiness dwelled in the holy of holies. That is where God was. But if we want to go to Matthew chapter 27, we're going to look at verse 50 and 51. And this is the moment when Jesus is on the cross. And starting with verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. And so essentially, he is splitting the veil, the dividing line between us and God's holiness. And the cool thing was, is not only was it allowing us into the presence of God, but it was allowing God's holiness out. So in the Old Testament, any encounter with God's holiness resulted in death or in the fire of God, in this fiery brimstone kind of death. But, and we can even see that because in the story of Moses, you guys know when he asked to see God's glory, it's such a, and Pastor DJ a couple weeks ago did a sermon on it, and I thought it was phenomenal. 
But he t- Moses says, I want to see your glory, your full presence. And he says, I can't or you'll be destroyed. So he puts him in the cleft of the rock, covers him with his hand, and he passes by, and he gets to see just a glimpse of God's back. And when Moses leaves this experience, he is so changed by just the glimpse of God's glory that he is glowing and radiating God's holiness to the point that the Israelites can't even handle it. So just, and sidebar, I was studying the other day. This has nothing to do with any of this. I just thought it was cool, and I can't think of another venue to share it in. So lucky you guys. Cool thing is, Moses wanted to see God's holiness, and he couldn't because it would kill him. But, you know the story of the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, and they get to see him transformed in all his glory. And the two people who appear with him are Moses and Elijah. So Moses did get to see God in his full glory. I thought that was cool. That made me really excited. It has no application to this. I just thought it was cool. But anyways, because Jesus became the high priest and is our ultimate mediator, in Matthew chapter 3, you don't have to look it up because it just take time and I'll read it quickly. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, it says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so John's telling this to the people of Israelites who have a long memory. In their traditions, they tell these stories and they know how crispy it got for their ancestors encountering the fire of God. So that probably seemed like, okay, what exactly is going to happen here? But this sounds intense. But then Jesus does come, opens that veil, lets us sin, and let's go to Acts chapter 2. We're going to read this story of Pentecost when it first came. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. It began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now where they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them with their own language being spoken. So the holiness of the fire of God, which was a death sentence to be experienced because of Jesus, is now the power that lives in us. Not only can we see it and experience it, but it actually empowers us, lives in us, and allows us to live transforming lives because of it. So what I started to understand when I had prayed on Tuesday, that that is what God wants for this altar in this place to be. And not even just specific to this altar, but our whole experience here as Christians and members of God's house and in Marion, we want to come into the presence of God fully transformed, fully enabled by his holiness to live out this powerful experience he has planned for it. And the cool thing is too, is it does still burn away all the sin. Not the sinners, but we can come into this moment, into this holy experience together, and God's spirit, his power, his holiness can cleanse all of that out of us, leaving us whole, leaving us empowered to pursue him with everything we have. You don't have to look it up. I'll just read it for us. Hebrews chapter 12, in tw- verse 28 says, there so, Therefore, Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God, acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So tonight, as we get ready to pray, let's just kind of offer ourselves up to God and say like, hey, what does your holiness want to do in me? Does it want to embolden me to take bigger steps for your kingdom? Does it want to work some junk out of me? And let's just ask what he has to do for us in this space. Because he is here. We're seeing incredible things happen in this church, in people's lives. People are being set free. Things are changing in the county, in the city, in the schools. And so I think for us, the question is always next is, what do you want to do in me now? What do you want to do in me next? So I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer, and I'll go ahead and turn the music back on. And let's just pray that together today. Like, God, what do you want to do next? What does your holiness want to renew and restore in me? Okay? All right, Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the fact that you did not leave us stranded or abandoned, but that you came 
fully present, fully God, and fully man to set us free. And Lord God, I ask that you just do a work in us today. Open our hearts, our minds to the work that you have for us to do and that you want to do in us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this moment. And just bless us as we look for you and look for your wisdom and look for your calling tonight. In your holy name we pray.